So of course you guys asked us how to visualize the coronavirus. And neither Manu or I are biologists or chemists or have anything to do in that field. Um, so we try to find someone who's a bit more trustworthy, let's say, in that regard. And we found this guy here. And uh, this is Jeroen Klaus. Is that is that the right pronunciation of your name? Yeah, that's much better than the English do it here. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm Jeroen. I'm a medical animator. Um, I run a small medical animation studio here in London called Phospho. And um, I love protein structures and particularly putting them into Houdini and visualizing them. Who doesn't? Um, um, so not also are you a medical animator you're underselling yourself you're also a doctor i heard or i read what kind of doctor are you um i'm well not a medical one um <laughs> definitely not a medical one and i'm um uh, quite happy that i'm not at the moment actually because um it's it's not a not a great time to be one i guess um no i've got a phd uh, in cancer biology and so uh, my background uh, is is in the lab and I, while doing that PhD, I quickly realized that I had much more fun visualizing what the experiments were going to be than actually doing them. Um, and usually the experiments didn't work, but the uh, visualizations to show what the idea was were always really pretty. And so oh, that's why, where the pivot happened. So uh, you're running your own medical biological visualization company um, in uh, Great Britain. And uh, your own, um, thankfully, agreed to uh, record a tutorial for us and walk you through how to visualize a very important part of the coronavirus. And as I'm pretty stupid when it comes to biology, I was surprised that um, there are several facts that are more important than I thought about this virus and several that are less important. For example, the first question I had to you was, how many spikes are there on this virus? And your answer was like... I, I mean, I, I don't know, and I'm not sure. There's probably someone out there that knows the answer, but it's not. Um, in in biological stuff like this, there's there's loads of variation here. So if you um, take a sample of coronavirus, then then there's not going to be an absolutely perfect set amount of these things um, on the surface. There's uh, loads of them for sure, but I, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not particularly sure what kind of range that you're talking about because, yeah, there will be lots of variability. And, and you pointed me to um, a detail of the virus that's actually, in your opinion, more important to its function. <laughs> yeah, so the, um, uh, the coronavirus, all coronaviruses actually only have three proteins on their outside. And two of those three are important in uh, building the shape of the protein, uh, sorry, building the shape of the coronavirus and keeping that shape together. And then that third protein is called uh, the spike protein. And that's the one that's particularly important because that's the one that's initiating the contact with the healthy host cell and um, makes the contact and then also starts the process of the virus the virus being taken up by the cell and then uh, reproducing itself inside your host cell these are these little nubbins that we see on the virus itself yes exactly and if you look through uh, an electron microscope at these viruses then it kind of looks like a little crown because of these spikes all on the surface and that's where the name coronavirus comes from so one thing that comes up a lot when it comes to proteins is a project called Folding at Home. What's up with that? Why is it important? And uh, yeah, why is it so costly? So uh, Folding at Home is a really cool project. Uh, b before we go into that, let's take, take a little step back and um, think about exactly how scientists get what a protein structure looks like. And so in pretty much all of the techniques that you can use to solve protein structures, you're taking just a single snapshot. And that makes it look like these protein structures are completely static. But in reality, they're very dynamic and they're constantly moving and changing shape. Um, and those shape changes can be really important. You can get very large shape changes. And in that case, you might be able to catch them with two different snapshots. And that's something that we're going into uh, in the tutorial. But the little micro movements, those you can't really pick up with normal techniques. And so that's where um, molecular dynamics simulations come in. And the problem with molecular dynamics simulations is that they're extremely computationally expensive because you're, you're talking about a protein that has thousands of atoms and you're trying to calculate the movement and the, a lot of that movement is based around electric charges of each of these atoms in 3D space. And it just becomes 
very, very difficult to do. So you need big, big supercomputers, big, big calculation farms. And many universities don't really have access to the type of com computing that they'd ideally like to have. And so what Folding at Home does is that it's a, it's a distributed computing project where they can get access to people's CPUs and GPUs when they're not using them and run those calculations. And by doing this in such a massively parallel scale, I think they were announcing the other day that they're now the world's largest supercomputer or something. It's yeah. it's unbelievable. And, and why is it, just from a biological standpoint, why is the shape and the changing shape of that proteins, why is that so important? So the shape of the protein um, is important for both the function of the protein um, and for the drug ability of the protein. And so when it comes to the function, a lot of the time proteins interact with one another through a lock and key principle. Mm -hmm. So it's very much a very particular shape of one protein will fit into a very particular shape of another protein. Mm -hmm. And so if you um, know more about what the structure of these proteins looks like, then that can help inform how they communicate to one another. When it comes to drugging, um, proteins that are active, for instance, in transmitting signals or, or um, in the case of the coronavirus in, in latching on to um, uh, the host cell, active proteins often have an active site that can be blocked. And so in this active site, you would normally bind an energy molecule that gives you the energy to do whatever it is that you want to do. And then if you block that by, by putting a drug inside it, it can't get the energy anymore. And it then uh, uh, is blocked from, from doing whatever it is that's supposed to be doing. I've got a prop for this. Um, <laughs> so actually, here's and yeah, you can pick it up like that. So here's a 3D printed protein. And if the light works, then you can see that there's a great big cavity here. Mm -hmm. And that cavity is something that you can stick a drug inside and block the function of that particular protein. And so um, this specific one is, is one that's involved in breast cancer. And that's what I did my PhD about. And so looking at, at how those drugs bind into those pockets. Um, and so in the case of the coronavirus, What they've just announced with Folding at Home is that they're going to do loads of these types of simulations to see how drugs might fit in the pockets mm. in particular important proteins of the coronavirus. And so that means that, that instead of having to go through years and years of endless repetitive testing of hundreds of thousands of potential drug compounds, they can try and do a lot of the, the early work computationally, and then hopefully kind of narrow it down to a few hundred key compounds that, that they can then test in the lab. Um, and those drugs that they are possibly developing that method, um, those are not vaccines, right? No. So these are small molecule inhibitors. And with vaccines, um, the way that works is that a vaccine make sure that your body starts producing um, antibodies against a particular virus. So it's basically a vaccine is, is, is in a harmless way. I do need to stress it's a harmless way is um, training your body's immune system to recognize and kill particular diseases. And so the drugs I'm talking about in this case are small molecule drugs that you would have for any other type of disease uh, treatment, uh, including for, for cancer treatments, including just paracetamol is a small molecule. So we kind of got into um, your area of things, which is the proteins, um, just from a molecular biologist's view. Is is this protein structure of the coronavirus something special? Or what's the special thing about the coronavirus from a structural biologist's view? So there are a few different types of coronaviruses. And there seems to be a, a, a big split between the ones that only make you very mildly ill and give you something like the common cold, or the ones that make you very ill, like... Um, this coronavirus we, we've got at the moment, or SARS or MERS. And it seems like one of the big differences is that the spike protein in the more infectious, the more, um, um, the, the, the coronaviruses that make you a lot more ill, in those cases, the spike protein seems to be much more readily able to form connections to um, the body's host cell. And so in the tutorial, we were going into a closed and an open state of the protein. And it seems that in the coronaviruses that give you the common cold, in those cases, they're mostly closed. 
and in the case of the, the the more severe viruses, they seem to be more readily able to become open and and um, bind to the body's host receptors. Um, quite a bit more strongly and affect them more strongly that way. Let's talk a bit about uh, what you did in the tutorial. You visualized a spike protein. And when we look at these images in the media of uh, COVID, um, of the virus, those are always red. Are they red in real life? No, they're, they're, the proteins that we're looking at here are so small, they don't have a color. Um, their size is much, much smaller than the average wavelength of light. And they're basically just a, a, a very ordered collection of atoms hanging together. So, and so anytime you see a particular color, then in that case, it's just one of us medical illustrators taking a little bit of artistic license because it would be boring if everything's just gray. <laughs> okay, so my coronavirus can absolutely be uh, gold and uh, silver. Whatever, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> Great. Um, speaking of artistic license of style, um, is there any particular uh, medical illustrator or a biological illustrator, someone in visualizations, whose work you admire or whose work you in inspires you? Absolutely. Um, I mean, there's many of them, but I think the in the field, the one that sticks up with head and shoulders above everyone else is, uh, is David Goodsell. Um, so he's... Um, a computational biologist uh, at the Scripps Institute in um, San Diego. And apart from doing really important scientific work, um, what he's doing as well is he's creating these really intricate, beautiful um, watercolors of the life of proteins inside cells. And um, they're, they're, just, they're just amazing. And they're very scientifically accurate um, and and aesthetically absolutely gorgeous as well. And so he's done a coronavirus um, among many other great things. So it's definitely David Goodsell is definitely worth looking up if you want. And coming back once more to the tutorial, um, you explored three different visualization styles for proteins. Why those three styles? So those three styles are approximations of the three main styles that scientists use when they're um, showing their protein structures. So you've got the surface structure on, on one hand, which gives you an overall view of the external shape of the, the protein. And in the surface structure, it's, it's very easy to see these kind of hollows and caves and dimples that um, could be a potential drug binding site. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the um, single amino acid, really, really detailed molecular view, which can be really important because you can see individual contacts and um, things like that. And then the ribbon view is is the most common way to show protein structures because it, it's kind of the best of both worlds. It, give you, it gives you a very um, clear idea of the exact topology of a particular protein without going into too much or too little, little detail. Again, I'm by no means um, an expert in, in your field, and I was um, surprised that um, you actually used Houdini over other more traditional 3D software. Why is that? So I started off in Maya, and I still use Maya for the main bulk of, of what we do, but increasingly I'm getting more and more into using Houdini. And on the, on the side of using protein structures, the thing that's really, really great with Houdini compared to other software packages is that in other software packages, you're mostly relying on external plugins to get your protein structure data into those software packages, um, which is great if, you, if you're if you just looking for a, a plug and play type of solution, but um, you don't necessarily have the type of granular control um, uh, that you want in certain circumstances. And when it comes to Houdini, Houdini is able to natively read protein structure files. Um, somewhat at side effects have has randomly written that into the code, which is absolutely amazing, and I'm extremely grateful for that. But what that means is that basically you, instead of it importing as um, an object, you're importing protein structure files, as we see in the tutorial, as big data tables. And so you've got access to all of the data that the, the scientists are putting into the, those structure files. And that can be extremely helpful in your visualizations and in making sure that your visualizations are as scientifically accurate as you can get them. Uh, Jeroen, is there anything you'd like to add? Anything we're forgetting here? No, I think... Um I think we're good. Let's let's move on to the tutorial. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, if you're interested in uh, biomedical animation, in uh, scientific visualization, give uh, Jeroen's website a visit, phospho.co.uk, if I'm not mistaken. And we're on Twitter at Phospho as well, and on YouTube as well, and in all the usual places. Perfect. Jeroen, thanks so much for doing this. And uh, Thanks, Mark. See you soon. <laughs> Cheers.